I want to talk to you about toxic religion. Kind of the opposite of, of a life-giving faith would be this. It would be a toxic religion, and it's so easy. It is really easy for us as Christians, although at one point being free and faithful and, and, and serving God out of delight, it's really easy to step into serving God out of duty, and we become burdened with a weight that God did not put on us. It's religion, and I want to talk to you about that because what is happening here is so life-giving, and we want it to continue to happen. Amen, somebody? But we all know, I think there's a lot of experiences and stories that I've heard that you can probably tell as well of the pains of religion, experiences and hurts and things in your past that you've seen, heard, or experienced firsthand about what religion has done to you or people that you love or you know. I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, the problem with Christianity is Christians. Have me say amen with that, okay? Anyone know that? Okay. We really are. Honestly, when I'm like talking to people, um, a lot of time when I'm traveling and I'm engaging in conversation with people and we're having a good conversation, when it gets to the point where they ask me, what do you do with it for a living? That question, I'm tempted to lie, y'all. Sometimes I'm like, uh, because it's going good and I know it's about to change. It's about to change of one or two directions it's going to take. After I say those words, I'm a pastor, it's going to go one and two directions. So the first direction is if, it's a, if they're a Christian. If they're a Christian, it turns just a normal conversation, and then it gets hyper-spiritual religious talk. It's like, I'm a pastor, and then, oh, praise the Lord, glory, hallelujah, brother, so good to see you, and all this. In fact, we were at Texas, I was in Texas with Pastor Brandon, we're getting some barbecue, man, waiting in line, and, and, and we're engaging in conversation, and they ask that question, and, and, and Brandon's like, well, I'm a worship pastor, and he's like, oh, really, brother, and he unzips his shirt and says, me too, and he's got a Christian shirt on. I'm like, oh, this got weird, man, and he's, all, he's talking to us from across the restaurant, hey, brother, I'm like, I don't know him, no, I'm just kidding, um, the second so sorry, y'all, sorry. The second way that sometimes people will respond uh, is, is not like that. It's the opposite of that. I'll say, I'm a pastor, and they'll, they'll go something like, oh. And one guy I was talking to is actually at an airport. I told him I was a pastor. He asked me, and I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor of a church in Bakersfield, California. And he said, oh, you know, I'm sorry. I don't like religious people. And, I, and, I, and I, I shocked him a little bit. I said, you know what, man? Neither do I, dude. I can't stand religious people. That's why I actually started a church. <laughs> Amen? So he was taken back, and he was like, what do you mean? You're a pastor. How can you not like religious people? Aren't you supposed to like everybody? And I said, okay, yeah, I do. I love everybody. I do. But I have a weakness for Christians who try to make their faith a religious thing. Because at the heart of it, at Christianity's essence, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship in Christ. And, and even, I told him, I said, even Jesus had a struggle with this, man. He had, a, he had a trouble and a weakness and it came to religious people. He would call them out on their hypocrisy. He would even say, this is not how it's supposed to be done. So today what I want to do is expose some toxic religion. I want to show you how to have a life-giving faith. And how we can have a life-giving church and expression of Jesus here in the body of Christ. I want to show you how we can do that. But in order for you to kind of guard yourself from religion creeping into the heart of any faith-filled believer in Christ, you got to know what it looks like. So I want to show you the forms of toxic religion. And we're going to be studying a lot from, the, from Galatians today. Galatians is a New Testament letter. Let me, let me share with you. You ought to read this book. You should read. It's a small book, man, but it's, it's so good, man. You ought to read the whole thing. Let me give you the setup. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to a church in Galatia. He actually planted. The Apostle Paul was a church planter. He would go and plant churches in cities that didn't have the gospel. They were actually what's called Gentile cities, non-Jewish people that did not have at this time the gospel or even the covenant of the Jewish culture and tradition. And so, so he would go to these areas and he'd win people to the Lord and start a church and raise leaders up. And then he would go off and replicate it again. And that's what he would do. And when he would leave, he would usually write letters back to them just to encourage them and even sometimes to correct them at times. So what happened though in this instance, when he left the church of Galatia, he left them life-giving. They were a life-giving church, but what happened when Paul left, these other group of people came into the church of Galatia called Judaizers. Now, Judaizers in that time, they were, they were people who, who kind of believed in Jesus, but they also believed that you need to be Jewish. 
you need to obey all the laws and the Sabbath and the rules. So they came in behind Paul and they said, hey, yeah, you know that Paul guy, he's all right and all. I mean, freedom and Jesus and grace, all that stuff is good, but he doesn't know everything. You need Jesus and you need to obey the Sabbath. You, Jesus, yeah, except Jesus and you got to do the ceremony and, and, and they kept on putting ands on top of it. And so they say, you need Jesus and circumcision. That was the big thing back then because Jews, in that time, Jewish people were the only people circumcised. The people that weren't Jews, the Gentiles, they were not circumcised. And they were telling them, like, you want to be a follower, you need to get circumcised. Man, I have a hard enough time getting some of you baptized. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Do an altar call, and after a prayer, and in Jesus' name, amen, I pull out a scalpel. All right, now. Y'all want to get right with Jesus. Come on up, guys. Come on up. How many of you know we'd have an all-female church, right? That's it. That's all the guys staying in the car. I love them, but I don't love them that much, okay? So Paul He's, he's furious at this. He's furious that, of what's happening to this church that he left, a very life-giving. He established a beautiful, life-giving church. And look what it says in Galatians chapter 1. Paul says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ, and you're turning, look at it, look at it, to a different gospel. See, I'm convinced that there are Christians think they're following Jesus, but they're following a different gospel, kind of like this Galatian church was that Paul was writing to, that there are even churches that think they're doing it right, they have good intentions, but they're following a different gospel, which is really, he said, it's no gospel at all. And he said, evidently, some people, those Judaizers, they're throwing you into confusion and are trying to do what? Pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, that word in the Greek, if you look up here, you guys, that word in the Greek is metastrepho, and it means to pervert or to corrupt, to distort, or to poison. See, they were taking the purity of the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, and they were distorting it. They were, they were creating a toxin out of this beautiful message, a poison. Christ plus something else is always poison. See, religions are man-made. They're, they're based on us trying to get to God. Trying to get to God based on rules and regulations and good works. But God's plan is not based on people's effort. God's plan is not based on our good works. It's based on his amazing love and his amazing grace in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen, somebody? That's what it's based on, the presence of God. Honestly, the presence of God here at Discovery has been so life-giving for me and so many people. And, and in order to guard that we need to know what a life-giving church looks like and how to have a life-giving faith because the Galatian church had it but they walked away from it something happened they started following listen a different gospel that Paul says that wasn't even the gospel at all so for a few minutes I want to expose some forms of toxic religion that manifest themselves in the hearts of believers in the in the heart and culture of a church because I want us to be able to protect and guard the bride of Jesus, to protect and guard this beautiful mission that God has given us, the church of the living God, his instrument of salvation and hope to a lost and dying world. But we need to know what these toxins look like so we can guard our hearts from it. Amen? Because even Jesus said, look what Jesus said in Luke. It says this in Luke 12. He said to them, and that was like all over the crowd, the people trying to follow him, he said, hey guys, watch yourselves carefully see jesus knew that there was this tendency in the heart of every human to try to do it our own way to try to get to god our own way to do the religious thing not to do the jesus thing it just is within the heart of every man to try to get to him our way so watch yourself carefully so you don't get contaminated with pharisee yeast he called it pharisee phoniness i love that the pharisees were the religious leaders of the time and he called them that religion is phony that religion is hypocrisy. So here we go. Let's take a look at the toxic forms of religion. See if you recognize any of these. Here's the first one. Write it down. And that is an external focus. I don't know if you've ever seen that, where there is just such a focus on the outward appearance. There's a focus on what someone is wearing, what someone is looking like, what someone sounds like. And, and you got to look the part and sound the part and speak Christianese and all that great stuff, man. It's an outward effort instead of an inward transformation. 
It's such a focus on the outward things than the inward work of God. It's outside in rather than inside out. It's, it's, a, it's a following Jesus based upon these do's and don'ts and these rules and regulations. It's very common, though, for Christians unknowingly, well-intentioned to fall into this category and fit right into just trying to look the part. The Galatian church fell into it. it. says this, as for those who seem to be important, I think that's so funny. Paul's like calling them out a little bit, shots fired. Boop, 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 boop. As for those who seem to be important, you know, they look like externally, they look holy, they look righteous, they look like they know me, but whatever makes them, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. God looks at our hearts. So these Pharisees in the Bible, they were all focused on their external appearance, weren't they? The Bible says that when they prayed, they would pray publicly and pray loud, and they would pray like, oh, look at me, how righteous I am, how eloquent I am. Look at how I can pray. Or when they gave, they would give publicly. They'd hold up their money. They'd be, oh, look how, look how much money I'm, I'm giving. And they would wear certain things and just try to set themselves apart. Even the people that they were around, look how holy I am. I'm hanging out with these people. I'm not hanging out with these people over here. Look how holy I am. This external focus toxic religion. Jesus hated this form of toxicity in the church, and he called it out, this external focus, when it was supposed to be an inward focus. Here's the second form of toxic religion, and some, this one's dangerous. Some of you may be here today. Spiritual indifference. It's a spiritual apathy. It's a coldness. It's this lukewarm. It can infect even the most sincere Christian, whereas at one point, you were following God, you had passion, you had fire, you had fervor, but somewhere along the way, it just got cold. You got indifferent, and, and, and you got disinterested. Oftentimes, it gets replaced. That passion gets replaced with other passions, and we get distracted chasing the wrong dream, that the enemy dangles a carrot in front of us, and we, get, we, we take our eyes off focusing on Jesus and the calling he has for our life, and we start chasing the promises and the, the, the pleasures of this world. Sometimes it's because we can't handle the very things that we called blessings that we became indifferent. Sometimes God blesses us beyond our ability to steward our spirituality. That he blesses us so much, promotes us that we can't handle the promotion. We can't handle the blessing and we start to drift away from God. That was actually what happened to the church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus was really blessed, the Bible says. And one of the ways they were blessed was in the area of wealth. And prosperity, look what it says in Revelation of that church in Ephesus. God says, I have this, I have this one complaint, just this one thing against you. You don't love me. Hey, you got, I don't need your stuff. You got a lot of stuff, good for you, but I don't need that. I want you. God says, you don't love me or each other. You, you got indifferent. You used to care for the needs of the people around you. you used to, your heart would break for people that were lost. You, would, you, you don't love me or each other like you did at first. Do you remember how it was when you first met Jesus? Do you remember the fire and the passion? Look how far you've fallen from your first love. And he says, like, even from there, all I want you to do, it's not too late. He says, just turn back to me. You're not too far and it's not too late. Just turn back to me again. And work as you did at first, because if you don't, and this is the scary part for us as disciples, even us as, as, as a church, you guys, he says, if you don't, I will come and remove your lampstand. God says, if, if you don't, I, I will come and remove the light. I will come and remove my presence from this place. If you ever think that what you are doing is about you and for you, and you don't give me the glory, hey, whatever doesn't turn into praise turns into pride. Will someone just one more time give God some praise for his goodness in their life and in the church? Amen. This is the, he, he says, I will remove your lampstand, your light from the churches. This is toxic, man. And it's destroyed so many churches where they, where they get to a place where they just stop thinking and considering the lost and others. And they start looking inward to themselves. Spiritual indifference. Here's a third form of toxic religion. And I call it presumption upon God. Presumption upon God, where we just name it and claim it and believe that God is going to deliver us to our happy ending. 
that God is obligated to, to answer every one of our prayers, to give us our happily ever, uh, ever after. Like God is, they, there's this expectation in this form of toxic religion that everybody should be healing others or healed. And if you're not, you're the problem. That is, that is a toxic form of religion that exists where people think like, no, no, no. If you have a problem, there must be something wrong with your faith. There must be something wrong with, with, with you, a mistake you made in, in your life. This was what was going on in the Old Testament in Jeremiah's time, and he actually said this. He said, they offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wounds. So, so he was saying, look, there's no 12-step program. There's no need for an eight-step. All you need is one step. All you need is Jesus. And it sounds good, right? It sounds like, oh, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. But here's the problem. They don't take for the, into account that we live in a sinful, broken world. And we all make mistakes, mess up. And, and, and we all have to battle with sin and temptation, every single one of us. So in these forms of toxic religion, there is no authenticity. There is no remorse. There is no brokenness. There is no repentance that is shown or walked out because, because we got to hide it. you got to hide it. And it's not even said, but it's, it's, it's practice. We're, we're in this form of toxic religion because if you have a problem, then you're the problem. There's got to be a sin in your life somewhere or a mistake you made. It's almost like, and if you have a problem, the least you could do is act like you don't have a problem. Just fake it. Just fake it, man, so that we can continue to like do, do, our, do our thing. And it's such a toxic form of religion, you guys. It's just, it's like a stench, a stench to God's nostrils i believe there's been so many people who have come to discovery that are that have come from these forms of uh of toxic religions an extreme form would be where if you have a problem that is continued they actually just push you out which seems extreme right but it actually has happened where where some religions like no 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 that like you actually are because it's not going well with you and you have that mistake or that issue in your family or that let's just it'd be better if you just don't even come here how ugly is that that is toxic religion, man. And, and, and I want to I tell you something. Listen, church. You're only as sick as your secrets. See, the enemy wants you to be silent. The enemy wants you to continue to wear a mask, pretend like everything's okay. And, and, and you will just get sicker and sicker and sicker. But if you were just to be authentic and open up and to share, because every one of us make mistakes. Hey, at Discovery, this is a hospital for the hurting, not a sanctuary for the saints. That's what we say. Now, if that rattled your feathers, like, wait a second, this, can I just say, this is not a sanctuary. This is not the sanctuary of God. You are the sanctuary of God. And can I even blow your mind even more? Even those of you that are hurting today and you're needing God and you're broken, you are the sanctuary of God because God fills clay vessels and broken vessels. Amen, somebody? That's how good God is. It's just a toxic form of religion, presumption upon God. This next one gets me really upset, man. Number four is extreme intolerance. Extreme intolerance where these... these they're judgmental and critical, legalistic. They're without grace for other people. And this one's kind of hard to spot because the people that have this form of toxic religion, they don't see it as a toxic religion. They see it as the high standard of the word of God because it's right. It's right and you're wrong. It's there. That's, that's, that's their heart posture. It's really hard to identify, but they're a hypocritical person. Just look who Jesus chose in his inner circle. Look, he chose people who were full of mistakes, full of issues, far from perfect. Take Peter, for example, constantly putting his foot in his mouth. He was even the one who denied Jesus three times, and Jesus knew it. Jesus told him, and he was like, no, I'm not. Jesus was like, yes, you are. And then he does it. And then after the fact, Jesus didn't come up to him and point his finger at him and say, see, see, man, I told you. No, he didn't. He said, Peter, he restores him. Come on, you guys, this is how good God is. He doesn't have extreme intolerance. He, has, he is extremely gracious. I'll take it a step further. <laughs> Jesus, you ever think about this? Jesus chose Judas Iscariot to be one of his 12. You ever think about that? Knowingly, the, the, the one who would betray him and hand him over to his to, to his death sentence. He chose him. And, and if you read the Gospels, Judas Iscariot actually was stealing from the, from the treasury purse of Jesus and the disciples. He was pocketing it for himself. And Jesus not once corrects him, not once even uh, confronts him about that. 
Now, I'm, I, listen, there's a time to correct and confront. There absolutely is. We see that even in the Word of God. But not every time is it time to correct and confront. Listen, if you live like Jesus, you're going to encounter people like Judas. Come on, are you hearing me, church? Okay. If you live like Jesus, Jesus you're going to encounter Pharisees who want to see you on a cross. All right, I'm preaching different than you guys are responding. I thought that was going to be good. <laughs> receive this, Romans chapter 14 here. I want to, I hope, you, please receive this. This whole, if, 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 if this is an area for you, please listen to this word. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Now he goes into one disputable matter, but you can put your own disputable matter in there. This is just one example of a disputable matter. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. He says the man who eats everything shouldn't look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for look, God has accepted him. See, I am convinced that there's going to be a lot of people who show up in heaven who are not accepted by religious people, but accepted by God. And there's going to be a lot of people showing up to heaven, a lot of religious people with their, with their resumes hold out and saying, Jesus, but look what I did for you. Look at all the things I did. Look at all the works and the miracles even and the prophecy and the signs and the wonders. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Get away from me, you evildoers. See, I think Jesus just has a different standard of what he calls accepted and, and not. And he continues, he said, who are you to judge someone else's servant? Hey, that, that Christian, that other follower of Christ don't work for you. You're not to judge them. To his own master, he stands or falls, not based upon your expectation, but to his own master. Is he going to stand or fall? And check this out. He goes, and he will stand. Not because he's strong enough to stand, smart enough to stand, qualified enough to stand. He will stand because I'm going to make him stand. That's why, he, that's what God's grace is able to do. And I looked up that word stand in the Greek, and it's histemeia right here. And it means, it doesn't just mean to stand like to hold up, but it means this. Continue safe and sound to stand unharmed, to stand ready or prepared. See, God's grace is able to not only make the weak stand, but to qualify the weak as ready and prepared to serve God. Come on, somebody, and give God some praise. That's what God's grace is able to do. See, God's grace is able to do so much more than we can think. This is a form of toxic religion. Here's the last form. Number four is an addiction to a spiritual high. An addiction to a spiritual high. And this is a spiritual addiction. It's an addiction not well recognized because it doesn't look like it. It looks like, it looks like this person is on fire for God. This person is just a holy person, but it's quite prevalent in religion for people to be addicted to a spiritual high. However, the addiction is chasing the high, chasing the feeling rather than the person of Jesus. And oftentimes people will, will fall into this form of toxic religion because they're trying to avoid a pain in their life. Or they're trying to avoid the, the backlash or the consequences of some mistakes and bad choices in their life. And so a lot of Christians will experience the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and which is real and tangible. And they'll experience that, and they'll go, wow, my life would be better if I had this high all the time. If I just could have this, that would be freedom. That would be better. If I could just have this high all the time, my life would be better. That is exactly what the addict says. If I could have this high all the time, my life would be better. And they have made the walk of faith about maintaining a spiritual high rather than pursuing a relationship with Jesus. That is not freedom. That is a form of bondage. And it is a form of toxic religion that exists to seek a feeling rather than seek the person of Jesus. Romans chapter 10 says this, for I bear with I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, look at this, and seeking to establish their own. That's what religion is. Trying to get to God based on not, God, not God's way, not God's righteousness, but I want to establish my own righteousness, my own way to get to God. 
they didn't submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness to everyone who what? Okay, here. Listen, listen, guys. I want you to get this. This is, you got to catch it. You're holy. You are not more holy and righteous based upon what you do or don't do. All right? You, you, you are not more holy or righteous based upon what you do or don't do. You are more holy and righteous based upon how much you believe. Okay, look, I, that's, I can't even teach that. I can do the best I can to teach that, but you can't really teach that. You gotta catch that in your spirit. And I hope today that something is shifting, that some skills that you were taught or that you were exposed to or that were told to you are falling off and you're catching a truth in your spirit because it's so easy. The Apostle Paul is like, well, you guys, I left and you were so life-giving. What happened? How did you so quickly turn to a different gospel? In fact, he said in Galatians, he said this, what has happened to all your joy? Because that's if, if you can't catch this, I'm telling you, religion will steal your joy. It'll steal your purpose. It'll steal your life. It'll steal your passion. It'll suck you dry. And if you're hearing this today and you're coming from a background of religion, or you were exposed to religion, I understand even the hesitation to some of these concepts because I have been exposed to some forms myself. But here's how it plays out now. Check it out. Here's how it plays out. So you're in church even now. You're in church right now. But you're in church because it's the right thing to do. You know it's, it's the good thing to do to be in church, and it's wrong to not go to church. That's why you're here. For some of you, you pray, but you pray because you know it's the good thing to do to pray. And it's wrong not to pray. Some of you read your Bible because you know a good Christian's supposed to read their Bible and have a devotion life. It's the right thing to do. And it's wrong to not read your Bible or even sin. Some of you don't sin because you know sin is bad. And it's the right thing to do to not sin. See, these are all truths. It's true. But there's a whole other level to where you would come to church because there's life in it, not because you had to. That you would, you would worship God with clapping, not because the Bible says to clap, but because something inside of you is burning and has to shout out, hallelujah, someone set me free. Amen, somebody. There's a difference when it's inside out rather than outside in, and you gotta, you got to catch it. There's, there's a difference, you know, from being nice to your wife, because I know God wants me to be nice to my wife, to being kind to my wife because there's life in that relationship. Okay, there's a huge difference. So how do we not fall prey and fall into a different gospel? How do we do this? How can we, how can we stay pure to the simplicity of this beautiful gospel that God has delivered to us? How do we, how, how do we stay in this tree of life with Jesus? I'm going to give you four things that are very important that actually Paul outlines in the book of Galatians. I'm going to outline it for you. How to have a life-giving faith and not fall prey to a different gospel write it down number one is this walk in freedom not slavery walk in freedom not slavery see every time you lean toward the rules or any of these forms of toxic religion every time you are putting you are returning to bondage again see that's and that's not my words that's the bible that's paul look at galatians again paul says this it is for freedom that christ set you free do you know why Christ set you free? Because he just likes you to be free. That's why you're free, because he just enjoys you being free. He likes seeing you free without any shackles, without any bondage. That's why you're free. He just likes it when you're free. So stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That's what he called these rules and regulations. He called it a yoke of slavery, a burden that we're putting on ourselves and we're trying to follow a rule or measure up to a standard that God has not set for you. Has, has anyone here, raise your hand if you ever got a ticket, speeding. Anyone speeding ticket? Come on, you're in church. God will strike you dead. Let's go. Come on. I, I, I'm got my, I got my hand up because I got a left foot, okay? I like to go fast, okay? Just being honest, it's not the right thing, but I do. I, I don't drive a stick ship, but every now and then when I get in a stick ship, man, I'm going to take advantage of that mug. And I'm going to go. I was driving Brennan's truck just the other day, man. He don't know, man, but I was, I was tearing that thing up, bro. <laughs> tearing that thing up, man. 
I like, so here's, here's the thing though. I have, I, and I don't know, maybe you guys have, have had this experience. I have it, but let me know if you, if you have. I've never been pulled over for going the exact speed limit. You know, never been pulled over? I've never, I've never been, and wouldn't that be weird if you got pulled over the exact speed limit, the officer comes up to your window, hey, excuse me, sir, just want to let you know, you were going the exact speed limit. And, and, and in fact, I want to give you a thank you ticket, a thank you citation. <laughs> You know, for being a cool citizen, here's a thank you. Say, it's a tax exemption now. Here's a tax exemption. We need to do that. You know what I'm saying? Give out some tax exemptions for us. That's weird. No, it doesn't happen, right? It'd be weird. Here's the thing, though. This is how a lot of us view God. We view God as this authoritarian, someone who is only there when we go over the speed limit and break the law to give you a citation. Oh, come on, somebody. We believe that God is only there to to write down that, that, oh, you're going too fast. Here's the problem, you guys. God, your relationship with God is so much more than a list of do's and don'ts. It's a relationship. Walk in the freedom of that relationship. It is for freedom that God sets you free. He wants you to be free. He doesn't want you to be burdened by regulations and rules. He wants you to be free. Here's the second thing that Paul says to the Galatians in order to get back to a life-giving faith. Operate by relationships, not rules. Operate by relationships, not rules. You need some life-giving relationships in your... Now, this is why you need a small group here at Discovery. You need to get connected into community. Get around some friends, some brothers, some sisters, some people you can do life with. And when you're doing life, please listen, don't throw the rule book at each other. Don't operate on the basis of rules and say, hey, this is... Don't give out citations to your brothers and your sisters. No, operate by relationship. You guys don't do that with your kids. I hope you don't. I hope you ain't writing your kids citation like, hey, you didn't wake up on time. Here's a ticket, you know. <laughs> Come on, operate by relationships, not, not rules. There was this lady in a church. Um, it was a different church, but, but she, was, she actually was uh, um, married, and her friend was married as well, and girlfriend, and, and her husband liked to be on social media and post about how much he loves his wife and always pictures and posts, and, and she got a little irritated by it. She told her husband, what's the matter with you? You don't love me like you. You're like, what's, you don't love me like he loves her. How come you don't post about how much you love me, and, and you need to be posting more about a relationship, and, and she was doing this comparison thing, and he's like, woman, I don't even have Facebook. You know, I'm not going to. That's not me. That ain't me. And so she's like, no, no, no. She keeps bugging him. And, and eventually she says, look, it's easy. I'll teach you. She starts a Facebook account for him, snaps his pictures, like, look, here's how you do it. Just post, post. And he still doesn't do it. She, eventually she goes, fine, then I'll do it myself. And she starts, <laughs> she starts posting on behalf of him about her. And it was just like, and she, she was doing it a lot. And, just, and so to the point that... He was hanging out with his buddies, and they're like, bro, you messing it up for us, dude. You better stop that. You're making us look bad. You stop posting so much about your wife and stuff, dude. What's going on? He's like, what are you talking about? I don't even have an account. What are you talking about? So she was caught, man. They caught her. Here's the thing. Look, this is how it's like with our relationship with God, right? Because we would rather it look strong than it really be strong. We would rather it to appear like it was strong than for it to really be strong. And I want you to know this. Listen, your relationship with God cannot get better. You cannot get any closer to God by following rules. You can't. By following a rule book, by some do's and don'ts will not get you any closer in a relationship with God. There's a lot of people who are trying really hard to stay in bounds to stay in bounds and to follow all the rules and your Christianity, your Christian experience is anything but a breath of fresh air. You're constantly beating yourself up and you're, maybe you're constantly beating other people up as well. Because there's some people, I don't know if you know anyone like that, constantly trying to keep other people in bounds. Hey, 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 you can't eat that, don't eat that, don't do this, don't go there. You know anyone like that? Come on, man. Operate by relationship, not rules. Here's what Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 says. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. This is the Apostle Paul trying to bring the Galatian church back to the true gospel. Hey guys, the only thing that counts, you're you're following a different gospel, the only thing that counts is your faith as it expresses itself in love. You see, uh, faith without love isn't faith. It's a different gospel. And love without faith is not love. It is a different gospel. 
See, he's, he's, he, Paul is trying to teach them it's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. You want to get back to a life-giving faith, operate by relationships, not rules. Here's the third thing, number three, put others before yourself. Put others before yourself. Um, and I love teaching this point right here because if it's one thing that you're upset about today, if there is one thing you're upset about today, it's probably somebody else. Other people have a really good um, knack for getting on our nerves and offending us and hurting us. So if you're upset today, it's probably because of a person or another person. Um, and I really felt this in my spirit as I was praying today. I really feel that, that some of you, you're carrying around the offense and a wound of uh, something about someone, and it's destroying your life. It's killing you. It's preventing you from being free, and you need to let it go. And, and listen, you cannot even really experience this, a, a real life and a real faith, a life-giving faith in Jesus, if you hold on to that offense. You, you, only, you only experience this freedom, a life-giving faith, if you let it go. You have, you, someone said that, that, that unforgiveness is like setting yourself on fire and hoping the other person dies of smoke inhalation. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. They're, they've moved on, and you're just beating yourself up with anger and bitterness and offense. You're preventing yourself. Your unforgiveness are self-made shackles. Let it go. You can be free. How do you do that? Put others before self. Live not self-focus. Live other-focus. Live Christ-focus. Here's what Paul was saying to the Galatian church to get them back on track to this life-giving faith from the different gospel they fell prey to. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Yeah, but don't use your freedom to indulge yourself. Don't say, yo, because I'm free, I can do it. No, no, no. Rather, this is what you should do. Serve one another in love. Because the entire law is summed up in this single command, love your neighbor as yourself. Put others above yourself. You ever, have you ever listened to those 9-11 phone calls of the trade towers when they went down and the people that were making the phone calls? They're just so sad, so sad. One of them just sticks out to me so much. There was this husband who was calling his wife, leaving a message on the answer machine, and they, they, they played it. And he said something like, honey, I want you to know we were fighting when... I left, and I left mad, and I said some things that I shouldn't have said, and I want you to know, honey, I'm so sorry. I love you. And it, it's, it's so funny, like, when, when you think you have a lot of time left, you got a lot of time to fight and try to get your way, don't you? But when you know that your hour is coming, you don't want to fight your way anymore, because that problem is not the problem. People are more important. It's about people. That's what it's about. And I think it would do us a lot of good if we just lived with this sense of we're a vapor, we're a mist, we're not promised today, we're not promised tomorrow. I think we would put others before us so much more if we just knew that our life is so short here on earth. Treat people, treat people the way you want to be treated. Put others before yourself. Here's number four. If you want to have a life-giving faith, number four, relate to God as Father, not judge. Relate to God as father, not judge. See, I, I, I coached my daughter's soccer um, for several years when she was playing soccer, my daughter Grace. And there was this one game. I remember playing this one game, and we were getting beat so bad. We were playing awful. We sucked. Okay, let's be, uh, we were not good. But we finally got like a breakaway in the tacking position. And Grace, my daughter, she was dribbling the ball, and she was there, open, open net, open attacking position, man. And she kicks that ball, and it goes wide right, man. And at that moment, my heart broke for my baby. I was like, oh, my baby. I felt so sorry for her. And, and she, she immediately, right after kicking and seeing the huge miss and mistake she made, she immediately turns and locks eyes at me at the sideline. And I knew she was thinking at that moment, her eyes told me, she was thinking at that moment, what does dad think right now? Did I let dad down? And at that moment when I was like, I wanted to run out to her on the field, I just smiled and I said, that's okay, baby. You're going to get another one. You're going to get another one, baby. And, and look, some of you think, if you think that God is, is this judge, this mean coach, that every time you kick it way far out or if you make a mistake or you, 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 you sin or mess up, that he's going to be looking at you like, oh, my gosh. Like he's this coach that's like, sub, sub, come on, come on, get out of here, kid. 
you done messed it up. You know what I mean? He's not, he's not a judge. He's not a police officer. He is your father. He wants, look, when you make a mistake on the field of life, he wants to run out to you. His heart is drawn to you. He wants to hug you and tell you, it's okay, baby. You're going to get another shot. It's okay. And if you can just change your view, your concept, your paradigm of this God that you serve, this God that we worship, this God that we read about, that we sing about, that we desire to be close to, if you could just change your view that he's not just a judge or definitely not a police officer, but he's a loving father, it will change the way it will change the way you pray. It will change the way you read your Bible. It will change the way you worship. It will change everything if you approach God and relate to him as a father, not as a judge. Galatians chapter 4, i got to hurry. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba. And that word means daddy. Daddy. Father. So you are no longer a slave. You're a son. And since you are a son, God has made you. You didn't make yourself. God has made you also an heir. See, Jesus wants you to know the Father. And when you know God as Father, it'll change everything. I don't know where, you come, where you're coming from today. Whether you have been exposed to a form of religion that has turned you off from Jesus. But what I want you to hear today is that Christianity, that Jesus never came to establish an institution, never came to establish a religion. He came and died and was resurrected from life to have a relationship with you. And that relationship that he wants with us is not based upon what we do or what we don't do. It's based on what we believe. And through that belief, supernatural power is imparted through the Holy Spirit into our life to change us from the inside out. That is the simple gospel. Amen, somebody? Can I pray for you all across this room? Can we just bow our heads and close our eyes?